Hey, I'm Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp. I'm outside Boston, and with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund, the director of the First Student of History, and we are excited to have with us tonight Chris Dubbs. He is a historian and author, and we are going to talk tonight about his book, An Unladylike Profession, American Women War Correspondents in World War I. Thank you for joining us, Chris. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, Chris, we're, we're so happy to have you. Um, I had read about your book and was, was just fascinated. Uh, it's an uh, aspect of history I wasn't familiar with. And there were just tremendous stories of uh, determination and bravery and creativity. Uh, why don't we jump in? Would t talk to us about one or two or three of the ladies who, who uh, against all odds, went to the front lines in the Great War and reported on it. Um, Sure, maybe we can break the war down in phases. Sure. Uh, so the women were there at the very beginning. One of the women who was a foreign correspondent, Mary Boyle O'Reilly, was already in London. She had been working in Europe for about a year, and she was there when the war began. So while all the famous war correspondents from America are sailing across the Atlantic, Mary Boyle O'Reilly's already in Brussels trying to report on the German invasion of neutral Belgium. And uh, she gets a, a bunch of good stories. Uh, but I, I think one of the things that makes her so striking, uh, because the, none of these reporters, the, the men show up in Brussels, no one can get access to the war. No, no one's seen the fighting war. So they're in Brussels for about a week. Uh, Brussels has surrendered to the Germans, and these correspondents realize, hey, we, we, don't, we can't travel anywhere, we can't telegraph out our stories to the publications, so let's get out of here. So they, they get on a train, they're gonna go to Germany, then up to Holland and go back to London. So there's so much traffic on the railroads, though, that they get put on a siding in Louvain, Belgium, just as the city is being destroyed by the German army. Supposedly, the citizens had resisted the invasion and uh, the town was being destroyed. So these five, there's five correspondents on the train. They can't leave the train, but they can watch through the windows as soldiers go house to house, burning the houses. And all these citizens from the town are being pushed into the railroad station, carrying all their worldly possessions. The famous medieval university and its library are on fire. Citizens are being pulled out and uh, executed, reprisal executions of some of the prominent citizens. And two hours later, the train takes off. They get to Germany, go up to Holland, and the men rush back to London to, they have a, a giant scoop. They hadn't seen the fighting war, and now they have. So they go back to London, file their scoops, and only one of these reporters goes back to Louvain for the rest of the story, and that's Mary Boyle O'Reilly. She hires a, a Dutch automobile driver. He takes her back. She finds women locked in railroad cars being sent to Germany. She gets back to the main. The town's still being destroyed. Uh, the citizens lay dead in the streets. Uh, and then she goes with a, there are hundreds of uh, refugees on the highways and she joins them as they make their weary way to Holland and uh, safety in neutral Holland. So when she gets back to Holland, she writes, she works for a, a new syndication service. And so she writes a series of articles that show up front page headline stories in hundreds and hundreds of newspapers in the United States. So one of the biggest scoops of the war is Mary Boyle O'Reilly. Uh, so it's a wonderful beginning to the war. So uh, there, throughout the war, there have been different correspondents who were over there at different times. One of the magazines that used uh, women most was the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, it was the biggest uh, circulation magazine in America, two million weekly circulation. And in the very first weeks of the war, uh, they rushed four women out. They sent two men, one to cover the fighting, one to cover the uh, warring capital cities, and uh, four women. And, and this was a novelty. This is, this is quite a striking policy 
editorial policy here. They sent one woman to Canada. The U.S. was still neutral, but Canada was mobilizing for war. So a good story there. They sent one woman to Russia. Russia did the extraordinary thing. And the day it entered the war, it instituted alcoholic prohibition. How would, <laughs> why, why did they do this? How was the temperance movement had been building steam in the United States already? And so this was an interesting story. But then they sent two women to Europe, um, Cora Harris and Mary, uh, uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt. And these women got some really big stories. They started to focus on the women, uh, what women were doing in the war. And uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt was over there for a couple of months and covered everything. Uh, she was on the front lines of the, and reporters were still not allowed at the front lines. But uh, she was a, a nurse, and she convinced the Belgian Red Cross to give her access to everything so she could tell their story in the United States. And so she gets into no man's land. Uh, she interviews the first interview of the king and queen of Belgium and the queen of uh, England and the commanders of the British and French armies in France. No one had done this. No other reporter had done this. And then she publishes... 11 articles in the 2 million circulation uh, Saturday Evening Post and uh, really proves to other women journalists that a woman can really make her mark here and be an incredible war correspondent. Those are, those are some great stories. I just was, uh, was, just, was just blown away. Uh, were, was, was their writing in any way different than what you would have expected from you know, from a, a, a male news reporter, you did mention that there was uh, that one of the the reporters focused on on women, I assume families, and in that aspect uh, for the uh, the lady interviewing the king, queen of Belgium, the queen of England, and so forth. That was hard news, as anyone else would have reported it. Most of the women journalists wrote feature news, features instead of hard news. Um, so how it was different than the men? Well, one, the most impactful story of the war was women's role. And what one of the, Cora Harris, the Saturday Evening Post woman started to do was change the storyline here. I mean, at the start of the war, women were portrayed as victims, passive victims of the war. So they were losing their husbands and their sons and a lot of women dressed in black of mourning. Uh, a lot of women and children were refugees, you know, chased out of uh, Belgium and northeastern France. They were showing up by the hundreds every day in England. Um, so women were victims at the start. But what Cora Harris starts to do is portraying them not as victims, but as active participants in the war. Talks about how Dramatically, the women of England, for example, mobilized at the start of the war to help the cause. I mean, they raised money and uh, purchased ambulance units for the front. They sent women doctors to Serbia and uh, established hospitals in France. Uh, they, of course, moved into industry. I mean, as the men were leaving by the tens and hundreds of thousands, uh, they vacated industry. And so they moved into munitions plants and uh, did everything. So by 1916, when Mabel Potter Daggett goes over there, she takes it even a step further. <laughs> Not only that women are active participants, but that the war is empowering women. Every place they had been kept out of before the war, higher education, the professions, the trades, they're now actively invited in. So universities are graduating their first women in engineering and microbiology. This had never happened before. Uh, and all the professional organizations are invited to women. They need to fill the ranks of the men who have left. So it, it's a dramatic shift. It, it, it really is an empowering moment for, for women. It's, it's amazing. That is, that is fascinating. Uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, of course, this was this was the Great War, a world war. Uh, now, the the U.S. was uh, about two years about two years before the U.S. entered. Uh, 
how did that change the reporting or the participation of women journalists? Um, well, it changed the reporting of all journalists, <laughs> men and women. Uh, as one journalist put it, they all became uh, willing propagandists. Uh, but a lot of women's magazine, this is the period when they sent correspondence to the war zone uh, because women wanted to know what was happening to their husbands and sons. Um, but it's important to remember there, there are two phases of American involvement. So America entered the war in April 1917, but it did not enter combat for another year. So there was this long buildup phase of training troops in the US and transporting them across the Atlantic and uh, training them in France. And then the whole mammoth task of building the infrastructure of war, the harbors and the railroads and the warehouses and the training camps and everything like that. So for this one year period, um, it was sort of the U.S. adjusting to being in France and the French adjusting to having, having the U.S. soldiers in France. So the women who went over from these women's magazines, and, and these are, this is good housekeeping and better homes and gardens and magazines you never heard of, the delineator and things like that. These are all women's magazines. And uh, so they wrote a lot of stories about the men adjusting to being in France and what they went through in training, things like that. And then in the spring of 1918, uh, America first enters combat and they're in combat until the war ends in November. And it's an interesting period. This is, when the US Army went over there, they only credentialed a limited number of correspondents. Today we call it embedded. In those days they were credentialed. About 15 correspondents were credentialed. They would be headquartered with the Army they would have officer guides who would take them out on excursions and near the front lines or maybe in the, behind some battle that was going on. Um, about 15 of them, all men, no, no women got credentialed. Uh, so the women had to be resourceful. How did they get access to the war zone and the fighting? So they hit on a wonderful idea to volunteer with aid organizations. So Organizations such as the Red Cross and the Salvation Army and the YMCA were enormously involved in ser support services for the U.S. Army. Uh, and these women would volunteer as nurses aides and uh, with entertainment units, the YMCA was sending out to camps all over the place um, with uh, canteen units that take f took food to the men in the front lines. And uh, there's some wonderful stories these women like to tell that even when their credentialed correspondents couldn't get past the military police to get to the front lines, they'd be driving up because they were taking hot meals to the men in the trenches. And so they'd get closer than the men. Uh, and so they, they did, they found ways to get access. They interviewed wounded men in hospitals. Uh, they served them hot chocolate in the trenches. Uh, they were with the entertainment units in the camps and uh, got to talk to the men there. So. Their resourcefulness is, is a wonderful part of their war correspondence. That is, that is really interesting. And you know, today we don't think of, say, good housekeeping, um, ladies' home journal, and so forth, as places where you would read about a war. Um, and uh, I, I believe these were actually these were in-depth, long pieces. Correct? Yes, feature feature length pieces. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> And it's, um, it's interesting because they, they, they faced resistance when they went there. So there's one correspondent who says when she went to the French war office trying to get permission, uh, they asked her outright, you know, why is your newspaper send you? Why didn't it send a man? Uh, and she had to tell them because I was the best person qualified for the job. <laughs> but um, they, their, their stories were more... I don't know, empathetic than the male correspondents. Um, one woman whose son was serving in the army wrote a whole series of syndicated articles, uh, a soldier's mother in France. And she just wrote about common experiences of the soldiers over there, what they did on leave, what they, their training was like, uh, what would happen when there was a battle going on or afterward. But 
maybe because they were volunteering, they got a lot closer to the men than the male correspondents, who typically were looking for battles and things like that. Uh, so you have wonderful moments. Uh, I'll try to tell this one story, but I, I choke up every time. So, so in case I do. But this wonderful story of uh, Clara Savage from Good Housekeeping magazine. Um, and she faced resistance when she went over there. She did get up to, one time she got up the front lines and she goes in and meets the, uh, the officer in charge of an artillery unit. And he says, oh my goodness, I, I've seen male correspondents up here, but never women. Uh, he's pouring himself a cup of coffee. He says, can I ask what publication you work for? And he says, good housekeeping. And he said, good God, he dropped his coffee. I mean, so the uh, assumption is that, you know, they write about what curtains to hang in the living room and 10 recipes for meatloaf or something. Um, so not about war. But Clara Savage had a, a wonderful article. She was in a hospital talking to wounded soldiers after one of the American battles. And this one soldier, he's a uh, arm in a sling, his head's all bandaged up. And he wants her to help him write a letter to his sweetheart uh, saying how much he loves her and can't wait to be back with her. And then he has to tell her one more thing and she help him find the words. And that thing is that his face is, is distorted and completely messed up. And could she still love a man like that? So male correspondents did not capture those kind of moments, uh, but female correspondents did. And, and they're tremendous, emotionally powerful stories uh, that are another side of the war that would have been lost without these correspondents. That is fascinating. What a, what a very touching story. Were there uh, women correspondents who uh, were writing for uh, the major wire services? You mentioned there was one writing for one of the syndicated services, I'm thinking of AP, UPI, uh, or uh, the, the major papers of the day, the New York Times, Washington Post, that sort of thing? Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, so there were working journalists who were over there and typically worked for major urban newspapers, Chicago and New York papers. Um, and most of them though were on, were freelance assignments. So it, it might be one assignment, go to Europe and tell us what the French women are doing during the war. Um, but there were a number of women who were over there, I mean, to call them freelancers is a stretch because they were over there for several years uh, some women who were writing for the uh, Barrett Evening Post, um, Eleanor Egan, wrote 65 feature articles during the course of the war. It's, it's a weekly publication, so they have a lot of issues. But uh, she was over there for three years, I think it was. Others made multiple trips back to the US, then back to Europe and the war zone. Um, but writing for you know the Atlantic and Scribner's and Saturday Evening Post and uh, National Geographic, uh, all the major magazines and newspapers. You know, Chris, I, uh, now we haven't read your book yet, uh, but it almost it makes one think of, you know, someone needs to, to do a compendium, and I don't know how much you, you excerpted uh, in there, but, but the, the stories sound fascinating uh, that they were writing. It's a really, um, uh, bring things to life in a much more you know, meaningful and tangible way. Well, I, I have done an anthology of their work, which will be out next spring. Oh, great. Um, so it, but you're absolutely right to see some of these stories in print and to hear that story of that woman who wrote about the wounded soldier. And uh, it's, they're just so, so powerful. And they're still powerful to this day. Mm -hmm. And the, the writing is, is so good. A lot of these uh, writers were fiction writers on the side. Uh, I mentioned to the novelists, uh, there were more novelists. Uh, so that they have a very good command of the language and the stories are, are amazing. Well, so I, uh, before we started, um, the three of us had a conversation and uh, Carrie and I encouraged you to, uh, to join us next year at History Camp. And it sounds like with that, uh, this book and the, uh, the anthology uh, next year, it's all the more reason that we would love to have you. I, I know this is a story that, that people would, uh, would love to hear also in person and, and meet you. So I hope, hope we'll be able to do that too. I'd, I'd love to do it. There's so many more stories uh, to tell about them. 
Well, let's, why, why don't we go, um, if there's, if there are a couple that, uh, that you'd like to go ahead and let's tell us, tell us a little bit more. It, 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 it's, it's just, it's just so fascinating. Well, let me talk about Eleanor Franklin Egan. She's the Saturday Evening Post uh, writer who, who published 65 articles in the course of the war and the immediate aftermath, the year after. And she was uh, probably the woman reporter who came there with the best resume. Uh, she, her husband was a journalist. They had founded the Manila Times in the Philippines in the about a decade before the war. Uh, but she had covered the Russian-Japanese War. She had covered the Russian Revolution in 1905. Um, and she was just happened to be everywhere. <laughs> I mean, she was the first and only correspondent to make it into Mesopotamia, where the British were fighting the Ottoman Empire. Um, there's a wonderful story of her. She wrote about five articles from Constantinople, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, while the British were fighting in Turkey in, in, at Gallipoli. And um, one of the things she learned while she was there that the Turks had systematically started exterminating their Armenian population. And this was all being done somewhat secretly. But she got her hands on the secret dispersal orders that were posted in all the Armenian villages, ordering them to go to the camps on the interior camps that typically did not exist. Um, and so they were sent with no provisions to feed them or their safety to wastelands in the interior of the country. And she snuck out, at the risk of her life, she snuck out a copy of these dispersal orders to show them to the outside world and prove that this was going on. Um, <laughs> this adventure was not done. <laughs> she was making her way out of there, she had to go through Bulgaria, just as Bulgaria was entering the war. And uh, she made it to Salonika, Greece, <clears throat> and uh, had to get home from there. And she got on a tramp steamer <clears throat> headed to Alexandria, Egypt, where she hoped to get in a British convoy to go home. And it was attacked by an Austrian submarine. <clears throat> and uh, it fired a shot across her bow, but everyone thought it was hit by a torpedo. And it was overloaded, and people start panicking and jumping in the water, and women are throwing their babies in the water, saying, someone rescue him, please. And uh, Eleanor Egan gets knocked overboard. She gets pulled into a lifeboat. The sailors in the boat are pulling dead bodies out and throwing them in her lap. They give her a, a wet baby to put under her coat. Uh, she, the Germans, I mean, she's the Austrian commander of the submarine, finally says, I, I'm not a murderer, get back on the boat. I, I didn't want to sink this. And so everyone climbs back, but dozens and dozens of people had died in the process. So she finally gets to Alexandria. But there's an example of the kind of high drama that these women experienced, sneaking out these secret orders about the Armenian genocide, being attacked by submarines. It, it, it just boggles the mind that they existed through all this. Well, indeed. Now, this is a story that's new to me, and I imagine it's new to many of the people watching right now. Uh, has this story been told before? No. <laughs> you mean Egan's story? I mean, in, in this story generally of uh, these oh. these tremendous uh, uh, heroic efforts to uh, to to communicate what was going on. Um, no, I mean there have been a couple of books about the journalists in World War One and almost exclusively focus on male journalists, um, including my own book, <laughs> American Journalists in the Great War. Um, you know, I, that's why I wrote this one, I think. I just felt guilty. I realized that like a lot of other historians, I had overlooked women's role in this or downplayed women's role in this. And by the time I did that, I, I did an anthology after that book too. And I realized that I had to tell the story. I fell into that same trap. I underplayed the role women had in this, in history. And I had to make amends. I had to tell their story and their story had never been told before. That, that is fascinating. Uh, now I'm just curious, uh, was, your, was your publisher as eager to publish 
the uh, this this latest book as they were your previous one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, good for them. They were. Uh, well, because as I said, there had been some books as about the male journalists, not as good as mine, of course, but uh, there had been no book about women journalists. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was. Uh, they were delighted to to have it. Yeah. You know. Well, so this also makes me curious. To what extent were women covering previous major conflicts, um, even going back perhaps to to the Civil War here in the States? Um, there had been a few outliers, I call them. I mean, there was a woman who in the 1840s, I believe it was, reported on an Indian battle, the US Army with an Indian battle. Um, there were three or four women who reported on the Spanish-American War. Um, so they convinced their newspapers to send them down to Cuba. And they wrote stories about mostly what was going on in Cuba and not so much the fighting war. This, uh, Richard Harding Davis, the famous male war correspondent, wrote about the fighting war and the charge up San Juan Hill and made Teddy Roosevelt famous. Um, so there had been, and most recently in the Spanish-American War, there had been some women. Uh, but World War One is the first time that they were a major factor in reporting the war. And to what extent were there women from other countries, especially, for example, um, England, uh, involved in covering the war? Oh, well, I mainly focus on American women. Sure, of course. But I do mention. Uh, one woman in particular uh, sent by the London Times in the opening uh, weeks of the war. Uh, she got into Belgium too and uh, wrote about it. Um, and there were one or two German women, I think, who uh, reported the war, um, but not many, not nearly as many as, of course, the American women were at an advantage early in the war when US was neutral because they can get into any country, any warring country they wanted. They get into Germany or Russia or uh, Turkey or any of them. So they, they had a, an advantage over women from England or Germany, for example. Do, do you have an estimate of how many women journalists there were from the United States that uh, filed stories? I, I deal with about 35 of them in my book. Um, I would guess there are probably at least Five or ten more mm -hmm. um, who went during the war or immediately after the war for the uh, Versailles Peace tr Treaty. Some of them went over just for that. Um, so I say probably this side of fifty. <laughs> and uh, do you have some rough estimate of how many uh, men journalists there were, how many male journalists there were from the United States? covering the war? Just trying to get a sense of relative sizes. Um, the short answer is no. Okay. <laughs> I, I could not even sure. get, because so many went over <clears throat> after the US involvement, of course, and they started credentialing uh, correspondence with individual divisions. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't be a credentialed thing, uh, correspondent, you'd be a visiting correspondent. And so there were so many more. I mean, so I'm just going to pull a number out of a hat, say 100, uh, okay. but there are probably more than that. Okay. Okay. But it's certainly a, certainly a, a very sizable number of women, not, a, um, uh, not an oddity at all, but, but uh, extensive uh, participation for many. Of, and uh, the one lady with the 65 feature stories and so forth. Really, really incredible. Well, the um, Saturday Evening Post, one of the reasons it got to 2 million circulation is because it started appealing to women readers. So it used to be focused on male readers, but it started writing stories about uh, women coming into the workforce and it recruited a lot of uh, famous female writers and it built its women's readership, which of course appealed to advertisers. And you know, the Saturday Post started out at about 46 pages the first month of the war. By the end of the war, it was like 250 pages each wow. issue. Wow. Uh, and, and so they, they needed 
content from women writers mm -hmm. to appeal to their women readers. Mm -hmm. uh, and Saturday Evening Post was just one good example of that. That is, that is fascinating. Now, what happened after the war? Was there, was there a market increase in women journalists? Um, a lot of them stayed right with it. Um, so one of the Saturday Evening Post women went into occupied Germany and started writing about the interaction of the American troops and the German people. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Peggy Hall, who had been over in uh, France during American involvement, <coughs> finally became the first woman to get credentialed by the US Army. Um, it happened like three days before the end of the war. And, but at that point, rather than go, she didn't know the war was gonna end, but rather than go to France, she decided, hey, the US Army is sending troops to Siberia. They have supplies stockpiled there and there's a Russian civil war going on. They want to protect these supplies. So she went with them to Siberia and Siberia was hell. Uh, I mean, all kinds of diseases, all kinds of Cossack warlords killing each other, slaughtering each other. The Japanese troops are there. They were our allies in the First World War and they had territorial ambitions. So there were confrontations with the Japanese. So she covered that for several months, fascinating stuff. And uh, Eleanor Egan, the woman I told you about uh, on the submarine, uh, went to uh, Odessa, part of the Russian Civil War too, and was there just as the Bolsheviks captured uh, Odessa and she got out just ahead of that. Uh, and then there were, there were women, as I mentioned, who went to the Versailles Peace Conference and covered that. And there were stories related to that but Eastern Europe was falling apart and Eleanor Egan was over there uh, covering a lot of that. So yes, they continued reporting right after the war. Fascinating. Uh, this, is, this has just been so very interesting and uh, bravo to you for, uh, for choosing to write about this. Uh, it's so interesting to hear you describe your, uh, your previous project and as a result of that, realizing this, this very large uh, untold story. One of the most enjoyable projects I've worked on. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Carrie, do we have some questions? So we have a question about Edith Wharton. I believe she was a war correspondent, which was news to me. I did not know that. I'm familiar with her as a novelist. I've read several of her books. Um, it makes me wonder if there are other names that we might recognize who are war correspondents during this time. Um, yeah, w w Wharton wrote just about four or five articles in 1915 because she was taking on tours by the French army. She had already been living in France as American expatriate and was a, a Francophile, if you will, loved France. And so she got, they trusted her, they took her around and she wrote stories for, throughout 1915. Um, as I mentioned, these names would probably not be familiar to you. Um, some of them were staff writers on women's magazines, um, other minor novelists, Cora Harris, who went early for Saturday Evening Post was a, a regional Southern writer. Um, other names that would would not be familiar at all to the modern reader listener. Okay, all right. So, what do you hope that people will take away from your book when they read it? Well, I hope they'll be excited by all the adventures these women had, and, and appreciate their their bravery and their resourcefulness and uh, getting these stories. But I, I'd like them to c come to appreciate too how. This was a valuable piece of the history of the war that's been missing. Uh, the stories these women captured. Um, and beyond that, I, I think that this is a, an interesting moment in the evolution of women's rights. So the suffrage movement had been going on for decades. Uh, the new woman had come into existence, women moving more uh, into the public realm, uh, just becoming more visible. and. Then this war came and they just, as Mabel Potter Daggett said, they, they became empowered by this. 
nothing. If I can read one quote from Mabel Potter Daggett, yeah. nothing that anybody ever said about women before August 1914 goes today. Everything they said she wasn't and she couldn't and she didn't, she now is and she can and she does. Wonderful quote, but, but that, that's the kind of empowerment that she felt that women had achieved because of all they were doing to support the war. That is fantastic. This has been absolutely compelling. I'm excited to read more about these stories. Um, and it sounds like your next project is the anthology that you're putting together. So we will look forward to that as well. That will be a great companion for this. Thank you. Out of the spring. <laughs> so Carrie, let, let, me, let me add just a couple of quick things. Um, you know, we've really enjoyed hosting these and I think we'd love to hear what some of the viewers think. So if you have been watching these, uh, these interviews, either live or recorded, and have feedback, whether or not you've enjoyed them, um, perhaps some folks you'd like to see uh, participate in the future, any feedback or ideas, please send them to ideas at historycamp.org. The other thing we wanted to encourage you to do is uh, let your other history loving friends know about these, uh, either send them the link or the next time we're live, uh, uh, send, them a, send them a note and ask them to join us. So uh, Carrie, who do we have joining us next week? Next week we have Jim Christ with us and he will be talking about the Battle of Paoli in the Revolutionary War. So we're looking forward to that. And Chris, we are so thankful that you came on tonight. And this was a great talk. And if you would like to buy Chris's book, we have that linked up on our website. And you can buy it there. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Good night. Okay.